Hello, everybody. I am Nebojša Neškovic, Vice President of the World Academy of Art and Science. This session within the WAS at 64 conference, entitled Sciences for Fueled Water and Energy Security, is a part of the WAS Program of Sciences for Sustainable Development, which is one of the programs of the Earth Humanity Coalition prepared within the International Decade of Sciences for Sustainable Development. The decade was proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly in August last year. The coalition, the Earth Humanity Coalition, is an association of international, regional, and national scientific organizations, including WAS. WAS was one of its founding members, and the foundation happened in April this year. Uh, and the coalition has been preparing and implementing various programs within the decade in close cooperation with UNESCO. Next slide, please. The last program I have mentioned includes two series of webinars. The first one is on science for human security, and the second one is on science and art for sustainability. It also includes five world conferences on science and art for sustainability, on big science with accelerators, on sciences for food, water, and energy security, on multilateralism and well-being economy, and the fifth one on big science in space. The program also includes a number of articles and reports and four platforms in science and technology for cooperation between the global north and the global south devoted to sustainable and secure development on the local, national, regional and global scales. As I have said, this session is a part of the program. Uh, I will uh, be moderating the session and the speakers in the session will be Thomas Reuter from the Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia, Ugo Bardi from the National Inter-University Consortium of Material Science and Technology of the University of Florence, Italy, and Nebojša Nakicenovic, Vice Chair of the Group of Chief Scientific Advisors of the European Commission. All the speakers are fellows of WAS. We will first hear the four speakers. After that, we will have a discussion between me as a moderator and the speakers, and also between the speakers and the audience. Let us begin. Thomas, the floor is all yours. You have 15, about up to, or about 15 minutes. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Nebosha. Okay, so, uh, as Nibosha said, I mean, the UN has declared the International Decade for Science, of Science for Sustainability. Now, in, uh, if we think about sustainable development, this is just another milestone in that process. Sustainability has become a major issue in, in the context of development. And uh, science has always been part of that, part of the information system that has driven changes in how we understand development. But science has not always uh, been leading to sustainable outcomes, quite the contrary. So I think I just want to start off by saying that we need to be critical about the role of science. If in this coming decade, its role is to improve. Next slide, please. Now, you see in the title that I'm going to speak about food security because I think of all the sustainable development goals, eliminating world hunger is probably the most vital um, because I think the crisis of sustainability we are experiencing now and will be experiencing increasingly over the next years and 
you know, this this probably a crisis conditions arising is in the next five to ten years. And where that crisis is going to hit first is in food security. That is why in the last ten years I've been working on this topic, largely in Indonesia, but also in some other developing countries. Um, also, I wanted to mention that the uh, Human Security Initiative of, of VAS, of the World Academy, uh, and food security is a huge part of what constitutes human security as a whole. Uh, and in a way, food security, the way food security can be achieved, tells us a lot to how human security can be achieved in general. And in advance, I'd like to say that it, it's my my uh, understanding that both food securities and, and all other forms of human security are systems features. That is, there isn't a single threat, there isn't a single solution, but our future is going to be determined by the state of a system in which um, many different concerns can be isolated, but ultimately they are all interconnected. Next slide, please. When we think about food security, um, or food, sustain, uh, sustainable food supply is another way of looking at it. There are a number of risks that we face uh, at, on the side of demand, supply, ecology, and distribution or market risks. Um, next slide. So I will go through these four points. The one is demand. The obvious uh, thing that comes to mind is population growth. As the world population grows and it's scheduled to reach about um, 10.4 billion or peaking at 10.4 billion in about 2080 or, or so. Of course, that's only a prediction. This is an older slide. <clears throat> it's just a really an, an illustration. And you can see the figures there, you know, pointing up to 15 uh, billion. That is never going to happen. So we're going to plot plateau about 10.4, but it's still about 50% than we have now. And uh, for some time, we've been struggling to keep up with that demand, but it's becoming more and more difficult. Next slide. The problem is not only that the number of human beings is increasing, but what they eat is changing. And one of the main issues is that as countries like China, for example, become more affluent, the proportion of their diet, uh, that is from animal sources, I mean meat and dairy products, um, is increasing. And uh, just to pick one out there under under uh, beef and mutton, yeah, and you look at India, it's increased a hundred and uh, it's it's scheduled to increase by about one hundred and thirty eight percent between two thousand six and two thousand fifty. So the per capita needs are increasing largely because a meat based diet has a much greater uh, impact. It's not as sustainable. You need about eight kilos of vegetable protein to produce one kilo of meat protein. So you need a lot more land, a lot more water, um, greenhouse gases in agriculture, which are three percent, thirty, about a third of all greenhouse gases come from agriculture, and most of those from uh, livestock. Next slide. On the supply end. Um, we've had a bit of a uh, honeymoon in the post-war period due to the so-called Green Revolution, which has been using uh, chemical inputs such as fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, but also insecticides, herbicides, and other inputs, as well as hybrids, so-called high-yield hybrids. Uh, and, of course, all this is driven by science. And for a while, we've had improved yields. And we can 
expect them to improve. This is kind of an economist's view of the future. You know, the solid line is what we will likely have. The dotted line is what we need. So you can see it's like a scissors, you know, opening. Uh, you have a increasing gap between what we think we can produce and what we will produce, uh, what we will need. So there is a supply gap. Part of the reason is that the Green Revolution has reached its limits and many would argue exceeded it. Uh, soils are impoverished by these rather aggressive methods of agriculture um, and yields have been plateauing for some time. On the right, you see a statistic of world grain production per capita. So if you, pr if you bring sort of demand and supply together, you see that the amount of grain available per person has actually been dropping for quite some time now. So the Green Revolution is really not going to save us again. Uh, we have to, in fact, undo a lot of the damage of the Green Revolution if we are going to have a sustainable food supply. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah. So we have a gap of about 69% in terms of calories. Now, this is a quantitative gap. I should add that the way the agricultural system globally is going, we also have a massive quality gap. So the quality of the food we're producing is dropping, the vitamin content, the actual nutrient content. But in the reports by economists, if you say, look at you know how much rice is produced, it's all you know so many tons of rice, so many tons of soybeans, and so on. But the quality of the rice and the soybeans is never discussed, and it's actually dropping. The nutrient levels are dropping, among many other things, because of the impoverished soils that we have, but also increasingly because of climate change. So that's there's also a quality gap. Okay, next slide. Um, now I will turn to some of the more narrowly uh, uh, sustainability issues, yeah, like uh, threats that come from a deteriorating ecology. Uh, one aspect of this is the wo world water security crisis, which affects not so much availability of drinking water or, you know, water to wash your hair or have a shower. That's not, it, it isn't sure, but the, la, la, the by far the biggest proportion of the water crisis is in agriculture because agriculture is the biggest user by far. So long before we have problems finding drinking water, we have uh, problems with irrigation water. And you can see there places like India, China are very much threatened. All this is set to escalate soon, you know, as the glaciers in the Himalayas that are supplying those countries and about three billion people in its, in its uh, uh, on, on its periphery. Once the glaciers are melted and they're melting fast and producing a lot of water at the moment, but once they're gone and we can work out roughly when that will happen, there's going to be huge problems. And also India and China have exhausted their, their uh, groundwater supplies through the introduction of electric pumps by the millions. So, yeah, huge problems. They're also in sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. Now, this is global warming. Three degrees. Recently, we had a statement or a survey of scientists working for the IPCC Many believe we, we will not avoid three degrees. Some think, you know, about, about half think that we'll reach three degrees and, and uh, two thirds bet for about 2.2 degrees or 2.5. So this is, this is a likely scenario. And the red areas are areas of high impact on yields, on agricultural yields on food production. So if this, if you factor this in uh, and it's not factored in into some of the production uh, 
forecasts, if you factor that in, we'll actually have a much bigger gap than what I said earlier. Next. Uh, now I'm I'm moving away from the purely, purely ecological factors and moving more into the human factors. And of course, it's not it's, it's one thing to produce food; it's another to actually supply that food to those who need it. And of course, poor countries are always uh, the first vic victims. People in poor countries, sub-Saharan Africa, where we have regular famines for example, but there is also a growing and downwardly mobile working class and middle class in rich countries that are going to be increasingly at risk of food insecurity. We saw this during the uh, food supply crisis during the COVID pandemic, for example. The other thing is that uh, distribution matters a lot because a lot of countries and certainly a lot of households depend entirely on purchasing food, uh, imports at the national level and and at the, at the household level. Yeah, most of us, uh, you know, uh, work on the assumption that food comes from the supermarket. You know, we have no access to uh, any means of producing food, most of us. So there is a lack of food sovereignty. So the market is more and more in control of the food supply, and that creates a dependence. If you don't have money, you're in trouble in a crisis, and more and more so compared to the kind of food sovereignty we had previously, you know, where um, production was much more distributed. Next slide. This is a graph showing uh, uh, some of the uh, cartel formation in the food world food system and how few companies really are in control of what we uh, have available in the supermarket. So in a way, there is a, a, a process of market capture and cartel formation. These are called the big nine in the food industry. And there's also market manipulation. In a crisis, speculators move in, they bet on increasing food prices and in doing so actually amplify the volatility, the movements in the market. Next. <clears throat> this graph shows how the volatility in the food market has changed. Um, Uh, it, I don't want to go into the figures because we, because we don't have that much time, but it's massively increased uh, in terms of the um, um, price changes, the frequency of price changes uh, measured as departures in, in terms of from the from the mean price in terms of standard deviation. So there's volatility is volatility is measurably increasing. Next. So the question is, what can be done? Uh, and basically, the story we hear from science is uh, gene, gene manipulation, uh, Green Revolution Mark II, you know, from the from from macro science and so on. But I think um, there's also another stream. The other stream in science says, no, we have to work sustainably. And there's a, it's a kind of a, a battle going on over the future of agriculture between those two camps. And on the one side is also big agro, yeah, and the big companies, the big food producers who um, want that industrialization. It's so a government supporting subsidizing the big producers rather than the small producers. But from the other perspective, you could also say with E.F. Schumacher, the famous economist, that small is beautiful. And what I mean in this context is trusting in family and community, community farming. Uh, so who is right? 
among these two camps, you know, and how does science come into it? Science has to, in a way, consolidate its opinion, or we, in a way, we are directionless in this field. Next, <clears throat> next slide. The fact of the matter is, and a fact that cannot be stated often enough, that small farmers control about one quarter of the arable land, but produce two thirds of the world's food already, or rather still, because more and more land is lost to small farmers and bought up by investors. Not only that, um, these small farms tend to produce relatively healthy food, you know, a lot of uh, vegetables, uh, diverse uh, diverse uh, foods, whereas the big producers tend to specialize on things like uh, sugarcane, uh, maize, uh, canola, and so on. Basically, a whole lot of crops that tend to be are either high in sugar or high in, in fat and poor in nutrients. So the healthy food, until this very day, comes largely from small farmers. And the same is true of small fisheries as compared to big industrial fisheries. And of course, the small farmers are able, with the right support, uh, and uh, you know both in terms of knowledge and and uh, subsidies to produce sustainably next now my work in indonesia uh, over the last years has focused on these small farmers and to some extent also fishers and uh, these people basically operate at a community level, produce locally, sell locally, short supply chains, and so on. Next slide. My work has been in this region here. That's the highland region of Bali. You see it's all, it, this was taken in 93, when I first did my field work there. Forested, lush area. Next. Um. The problem is that I think I think there's something wrong with the slide here. Is that maybe the next one? Just a second, I have to cross check. Oh no, yeah, no, that's correct. Uh, one of the problems with the small farmers in Indonesia, for example, is that governments interfere in their operations massively. In Indonesia. The state fixes the price for staples like rice and cooking oil and so on. So it's called the State Logistics Agency or Bulog. Now, what that means is that in order to feed the poor, who are poor because they receive low wages, which is great for industry and great for exports and all that. So to keep this low wage sector going, you have to have a low price for stable food, and who? how do they do it? They do it on the backs of the small farmers, pushing the price down and making their um, profits shrink. So it destroys farmers' livelihoods, this kind of intervention. And also, uh, farmers suffer from the astronomically increasing cost of uh, chemical inputs. And we, we might, you might have heard of the, the massive wave of farmer suicides in India. It's, it's not quite as bad in Indonesia, but a lot of people just leave the sector, especially younger people don't want to continue. Next slide. Okay. Now, I, I talked about the highlands a second ago. Now, in 93, before all these changes started, uh, this is a farm, okay? It may not look at it, it may look like a jungle to you, but it's actually a farm with something like 200 different food plants. Okay, maybe not in that frame, but in a, in a, in a sort of typical, typical small farm. Extremely high biodiversity, ecologically great, 
and also resilient. If you have a trout in this kind of environment, some crops fail, but others don't. Others are trout resilient. So basically, this was a very secure, sustainable system. Next. The products were hundreds of different crops, biodiverse, uncontaminated, organic. The method was ecologically sustainable, regenerative, circular. The aim of the whole exercise was to feed people and to keep them healthy. Might sound simple, but it's not. The context was community. The result was 100% food sovereignty, as in people didn't need to buy food, no market dependence, and pretty solid food security. Okay, and healthy foods. No non-communicable diseases, hardly any, hardly any at that time in Highland Bali. Next. Then we had the Green Revolution, the sort of the, the new thinking in agriculture. And suddenly, the whole region has moved to a single crop, citrus fruit. The whole land is contaminated with toxic inputs. The method is extractivist, ecologically destructive. It's about cash crops. And the aim is to make as many dollars as possible short term. The context is the market. There's no food sovereignty. Farmers need to buy food because they only grow citrus. You can't live off that. So food security is precarious. If they have a, if there's a market downturn, the prices collapse. They struggle to get find uh, to buy food, and the diet has changed. It's become the food they buy is largely processed food. Suddenly, we have a massive incidence of non-communicable diseases. Next. The forest is gone, as you can see um, on, from this picture. Okay, next slide. There you see some of the citrus fruit being loaded onto trucks. And next. And the chickens that once used to roam the villages are now caged and fed with copious amounts of antibiotics. Next. <clears throat> and this is these are offerings to the gods actually you know a little bit uh, maybe about Bali and it's it's uh, a Hindu religion a form of Hinduism but even the offerings for the gods are now uh, the, the junk food has arrived so even the gods have to eat junk food and let alone the people the children the school children that's just a little symbol of what's happened to people's diet. Next. This shows cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension and stroke um, in Southeast Asia. And you can see how massively that's increased from almost nothing to, you know, a very high incidence in some cases. In particularly uh, diabetes and <clears throat> uh, hypertension, typical civilizational diseases, as we call them. Well, wrong kind of civilization. We're actually losing the civilization we had when it comes to diet. Uh, and these countries like Indonesia are not prepared for this. People are really dying on mass from diseases like diabetes that we might find manageable here in the West. Next. So there's a huge, you know, economic cost as well. Um, whereas in, in a lot of these developing countries, it used to be the infectious diseases that were the biggest public health burden. That's all changing rapidly also in India and many other places, China and so on. Next. Um, as I said, while the risk in Asia for these diseases now is almost the same as with us in, with in Europe or in the US, the outcomes are very different. The incidence of deaths from these diseases is much higher. Okay, next. <clears throat> so what you find now, what I've been studying in Indonesia is a movement of farmers uh, for sustainable agriculture. Not science for sustainability, but 
farmers for sustainability. People who often have a relatively moderate level of formal education, but who are very uh, clever and very knowledgeable in other ways. And there's now a national movement of farmers that has about 2 million members. And they are coordinating their efforts, saving seed, uh, getting uh, off the uh, addiction to chemical inputs, producing organically, sh shortening supply chains, working with consumer organizations to direct market their product and so on. So there's a lot happening. And frankly, in my 20 years of experience with international organizations trying to bring about change in the world, and I mean science organizations, um, frankly, I'm, what gives me hope is not those organizations, but these kinds of grassroots initiatives. If something's going to save us, it's going to come from below, I think, because these are the people who are not talking the talk, but walking the walk and actually making massive uh, changes on the ground, real, real change. Uh, I believe science needs to get behind this kind of initiative. It needs to get behind small farmers, needs to lobby national governments to change their subsidy programs and stop the subsidies all going to the big players and redirect them to small farmers. You know, the farmer protests in Europe. Uh, I think it is a lot about that problem. Those protests are largely about such problems. Um, these, look, at least farmers are able to produce in a very clean way, in a circular way. And they're innovators. And these solutions, I think, need to be shared. And science can be play a big role in um looking at how to reform the system the governance the policy um the support systems uh and learn from the farmers about how they are doing it also at an organizational level okay that's really all i wanted to say thank you thank you very much thomas let us continue continue we have to uh go on Ugo, you are the next speaker. Please, the floor is yours. You have fifteen minutes. Please. Thank take you. Care of the timing. So it is a pleasure to be here, to be invited. I am a recent member of the WAS, the World Academy for Arts and Sciences, and it is my second seminar on this uh, with this organization, which I, I hope I will be able to contribute more in the future because it is a very interesting um, group of people and and it is a pleasure to have this possibility. So today I have the task of uh, showing you some data relative relative to a work that uh, some work that we made with the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome has a very general approach. Our models apply to uh, many kinds of systems, and uh, we have applied them to the economy, to the global economy, and also to food production, and in particular to food production in uh, uh, the sea, in the oceans, seafood, or anyway, food from the sea. Mm. So we have this um, uh, concept. Uh, let me show you first the a little bit about the Club of Rome. As you know, the Club of Rome is the organization which produced the study titled uh, The Limits to Growth in 1972, which is shown here on the right side in the yellow square. And you see these curves. They were the results of one of the first models, one of the first global models, which tried to uh, not so much to predict, but to um, envision the future, what the future could be if we were to keep in our ways. And uh, this first study in 1972 was very much in line with the presentation, with the results that Professor Reuter showed to us before, because it shows that the food per capita should have peaked 
around 2020. And the, one of the slides that you show to us shows exactly that. The food for capita actually peaked um, around, if I remember correctly your slide, it was around 2010. And that's exactly what it could have happened if uh, some lines had been pursued. <laughs> I mean, this works. So it's, um, I was surprised by your, your slide, uh, Professor Rother. It's, uh, it's exactly what we was predicted 50 years ago. Unbelievable. And but the, I'm not going to speak about that today. I'm going to focus on the on one of the reports uh, that we produced for the Club of Ram, Rome in 2019, titled "The Empty Sea," prepared by myself and my colleague Ilaria Perissi, where we apply the same model to the ocean, to the fisheries, to food production from the sea, and. Rather quickly, these are the way these models are made, but I'm not going to to go into this because it will take a lot of time just to show you that the models are not so complicated, actually. <laughs> if you compare this to things like a climate model, then you see this is a toy model in comparison. But the point I'm trying to make is that models have to be effective by considering only the fundamental elements of the system. You can make a bad model if you consider too few components, but also if you consider too many, and that's a typical problem with modeling. You try, and sometimes you succeed in um, examining the system by choosing the right number of parameters. And the modelers who created the first world models in the 1970s, they had this skill. They could they could uh, create model that caught the main elements of the system. So let me go to the to the seed, to the food production. And there is a difference. And as I said, I'm not going to go into the details, but what you see on the left is a typical conventional model. The way models of food production or fishery production are made, which are they are excellent model, but they take into account normally, mostly what is below the sea. You see here, in this model, they take into account the, the stock of fish, the ecological parameters, how many, a lot of the fractional fish which is captured, the landing, and, and also economic factors, but it is all below. A true dynamic model may be simpler. This is highly simplified it's in real a real model is much more complex than this, but but this, this image on the right catches the main elements of the of the system. It is an integrated model which includes the economy, the economy, the economic system. The it is an economic system which captures, make it possible for the fishing industry to operate and the resources here is the fish, the fish stock. So this model is important, it's fundamental because it contains an element that conventional economic and fishing models do not have normally, the concept of overshoot. Overshoot is, a, is an idea which, is, um, which was proposed back in the 80s and was incorporated in the models, the dynamic models created by the Club of Rome. It is a fundamental parameter parameter of the way we exploit the natural resources. And unfortunately, I must say that it is not well understood by most uh, economic models. Economic models are normally based on the idea that there is an equilibrium point. If you go examining how the fishing, fishery models operate, the standard ones, they try to reach a stable state. They try to determine which is the maximum sustainable catch level, which is a good idea, but it unfortunately doesn't work so well because you're if you make a mistake, and you all often do, you go uh, to propose a catch level that is above the actual, suppose that there is one uh, affordable or sustainable catch level, and then a series of bad things happen. In the, in, the, in the sense that uh, if you catch over 
exploit the resource, you go into the overexploitation regime and uh, and you go worse and worse because you catch more fish than you can, than we should, then the model says, oh, we're sorry, we made a mistake, so we, you lower the catch level, but that remains over the limit. And so this, the end of the story is the destruction of the resource. This is the essential uh, point of the of the um, dynamic modeling of uh, resource exploitation. It's very interesting because, because when you study this subject, the study of how fisheries are managed, then you see a lot of discussion and some people speak about the managed destruction of the fish stock, which is what happens. It has happened many times. I'll show you a few examples. And that's not the way, unfortunately, to manage a resource, but unfortunately, it is... It is not the way you should, but it is the way it is done, very unfortunately. So let me show you some very simple results. This is a simplified model of overexploitation. I show you that the resource, the, econ the fishery, the fish stock, is uh, consumed and, and, uh, and uh, the production of the resource this curve, this bell-shaped curve, the fish production goes through a maximum and then declines to zero. Actually, there's many cases in which this happened for real. So the model catches this fundamental point. And personally, the, I, I got interested into this, this um, story when I, from reading Moby Dick, the novel about whaling, as you know. And, <laughs> and then... My first model in this field tried to account for the managed destruction of the whale stock in the 19th century. And you see these results. This is a, a very early result of mine. It was done with a very simple model. And then I, I found these data and said, well, what the hell? It works. So what happens here? <laughs> on one side, you have the whales, this curve. And on the other side, you have the uh, fishing fleet the whaling fleet, actually, in this case, and you see that there is a typical over-exploitation curve that eventually led to the complete destruction of the species of whales which were uh, hunted back in the 19th century. Now the cycle restarted later on with other kinds of whales, but the story is the same. If we keep fishing, we keep hunting, we keep even cultivating also the same thing, and we exploit a non-renewable resource or slowly renewable resources such as whales, it's, uh, you, you eventually destroy it. And that's a big problem, as, as, as you see. And that's very general. I can show you some data for the overall fish, fish catch in the United Kingdom. Another case in which, apart from oscillations caused, uh, of course, by wars and things, uh, you have another typical bell-shaped curve that goes up and then goes down. And this is has not recovered yet. This is an interesting case. I could tell you a lot about this story because I've been studied a lot because we know everything about fishing in the United Kingdom and we know how people tried to overcome the decline of fishing. The, the way they tried to do that was the wrong way. Again, they fished more, and fishing more causes the stock to go down more. And if we go down, down more, the system goes eventually down to zero, and that's very bad. But it can be worse, actually. If you, if you like to see a little more, I can show you a modification model, which is the Seneca model, what I call the Seneca model from the Roman philosopher who had this advantage of being the first who noted that things grow slowly and then fall rapidly. It happens all the time. And I'm not going into the details of this model because I just have a few minutes left. But let me just show that we are not talking about just models, but about things that happen for real. This is the case of caviar um, in, uh, in um, the Caspian Sea which showed exactly this behavior. It's over-exploitation and what is a managed destruction of the stock, despite the fact that the catch of, uh, um, of caviar was managed from, uh, from the institutions. It was in a planned economy in the Soviet Union, but it was poorly managed and 
destroyed. This is very typical. And it can be worse. I mean, it doesn't depend so much on whether you have a state-controlled economy like caviar in the United States, I'm sorry, the Soviet Union, but also in a system which is completely, it was completely um, free market in principle. You had no, you, you, you did have quotas, but the quotas never worked. So the cod, cod fisheries in uh, Canada, in Eastern Canada, they went through this Interesting. I think I think you could be fascinated by this curve because it shows first a slow growth. At some moment, they 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 had a, a glorious moment in which they say, "Wow, so much fish! We're doing very well." And and then you you remember this age in the early two thousand when you nineteen nineties when you have this uh, cod in the form of fish um, fish sticks were very common in uh, in uh, the Western world. The fish sticks still exist, but not anymore from the Eastern Canadian cod. They are made now from other 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 fisheries, cod fisheries. And this is unfortunately what happened. And you can imagine, oh, this is going so well. It's, no, it's wonderful. We go uh, all the way up to the stars and then bang. It went down, and this this is, was a lesson that some people learned. It is about cod. The people wrote papers titled "The Managed Annihilation of Cod Stocks," which is what happened. I mean, this they, 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 this was managed by quotas, and all the time they managed so poorly that it it went to zero. And um, let me show you to finish the world situation, which is a very interesting also subject, and we don't have, not yet, the bell-shaped curve, which is typical of um, individual single single fisheries, but the production is not increasing anymore. It has not been increasing. The catch has not been increasing anymore for since the year 2000, more or less, the past 30 years, which means that a uh, big effort is being made <clears throat> to keep production going, big effort. But if we continue in this way, um, this production is going to decline. There is nothing to do about that. People normally say that aquaculture can solve the problem. Call it, let's call it a problem. The aquaculture can replace uh, wild catch, capture fisheries. But unfortunately, you you should know probably know that uh, um, aquaculture is an um, offspring of uh, captured fisheries. You simply uh, in aquaculture you simply use the captured low quality fish to feed um, higher quality fish, which uh, which are kept in in cages or or pools where they are produced. So we have this. Um, interesting moment in which the um, standard fisheries are capturing low quality low quality fish but you can still find um, salmon tuna and and um, other kind of uh, expensive fish in supermarkets because it is produced at the expenses of the low quality fish captured by by the fisheries now not notice that the, the fish that you capture here is not eaten in large part by humans. It is used to feed the expensive fish. So it is a net loss for humans if they need to eat. Not everybody, of course, can afford to eat aquaculture salmon, for instance, one of the most common things. So I, I you see how many things, how many interesting things are in this field. It's fantastic. Uh, but let me close and summarize that uh, the point we have the system dynamic models realistically describe fisheries it is it is a uh, but unfortunately they're not used so much in in uh, practical fishery management which is too bad that we have uh, a serious global problem of overfishing not just in fishing of course overfishing is just a manifestation of the general tendency of humans to over exploit resources and uh, i already told you that uh, that uh, what we're doing with aquaculture aquaculture generally speaking is not a good idea 
And the main problem that we have is that we don't have a good model to determine quotas. And Max history is a long, long story. Of, there's a huge amount of work done on how to determine quotas, how to implement them, how to find good ways to have them accepted. In my modest opinion, they don't work, this is the more you use quotas, the worse you do things, but but that way, it is a, a personal opinion. Maybe somebody will find a good way to use quotas, quotas to avoid overexploitation, but it's very difficult. So um, I spent about 15 minutes presenting to you the problem, and now I would need <laughs> some time to present you the uh, solutions, but, uh, but I just stop here, and I, my impression is that uh, we need a different kind of approach, of course, which is very general. So do we need marine reserves? My opinion is yes, yes, they are a good idea, because once you decide that a certain section of the sea is off limits, then you don't have to worry about quotas. It, uh, it will, that part of the ecosystem will be saved, and this will be a kind of new rules, but I think we need new actors, because also the um, the fishing industry, the worldwide fishing industry can be described with a, a term which I would say far west, like in the movies, because it is really extremely difficult to manage um, such a huge enterprise, which includes practically the whole world with actors which go from industrial fisheries to the low, mm, to the traditional uh, fisheries, uh, small-scale fisheries. So it's it's an extremely difficult field, which is in the hands of some highly powerful players. Uh, again, as Professor Rother said, it's it's the food industry is in the hands of a few entities which don't necessarily have the stability of the ecosystem in mind. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I think I can stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ugo. Thank you very much. It was very interesting, but we should go on. Uh, Naki, you are uh, the next, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really delighted to be on this panel, um, and I would like to thank the Academy for the invitation. Let me say, like, uh, like Hugo, I'm also a recent member, so it's even a bigger pleasure to to have a chance to say a few words. Um, uh, I will be uh, now speaking about energy security. But before I do that, let me just uh, uh, say that I was introduced as uh, 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 vice chair of the group of chief scientific advisors to the European Commission. I just want to avoid any misunderstanding. I'm speaking here on my own personal capacity and not on the behalf of the scientific advice mechanism of the commission. And I said, I'll be talking about secure uh, security in energy. I don't think that can be separated from the affordability of the energy. And exactly like uh, Thomas said at the beginning, this is a systems property. It's not only about supply, it's also about the systems transformations and about the end use and services. Next slide, please. I, I wanted to illustrate to you, yeah, here, what are the major challenges if we talk about energy security? Uh, if you look on, on the left, you have energy supply, illustration of the energy access challenges. And as you can see in the, in the, in the, uh, in the picture above, uh, people are uh, charging their telephones. That's because about 700 million people in the world do not have access to electricity, but almost everybody has a mobile phone. And then above that is the picture of unsustainable cooking uh, with um, uh, traditional biomass that leads to about estimated 4 million premature deaths in the world. So it's a huge huge challenge, and I would argue that this is the really part of the energy insecurity. Um, very often we think about the supply and therefore also military guarantee of the security, but I, I would argue it is 
the system's quality. The other, the other dimension is the air pollution, that energy is also primarily responsible through burning of the fossil fuels. And, and curiously, that accounts for another 4 million premature deaths. So altogether, about 8 million people die prematurely in the world because then they do not have access to affordable and clean energy. And then climate change, perhaps one of the biggest challenges facing humanity. Um, as you know, uh, or perhaps uh, have heard that last year was we have increased the global mean temperature already by one and a half degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels last year. And that is exactly what the Paris Agreement should be. So we are going to overshoot the Paris Agreement, not just overshoot our fishery catching and the land use for agriculture. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to illustrate here to you that energy security is perceived as one of the really important dimensions of energy. This is based on a poll of 24,000 people in 28 countries. If you look at the panel on the li uh, left on the top, many countries around the world, uh, red is energy security, green is affordability, and blue is environment, in particular climate. So you can see that energy security is on the top list of those countries. Below are some of the countries in Europe and Australia that have affordability as a bigger challenge. That's understandable because energy prices have skyrocketed, also with the conflicts in the world, but also in the aftermath of the COVID-19. And on the right, you see uh, some of the countries where climate and environmental concerns have a uh, come in the foreground. But if you look at the bottom, the global average is energy security is the top challenge, followed by the other ones I mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I think with that aftermath, let me just argue that um, one can say that the world is at the crossroads uh, because huge achievement has been, uh, huge achievements have been achieved uh, I, Thomas also referred to that in his presentation. Um, during the last 200 years, global economy grew about 100-fold. Um, energy 50 times, emissions about 30 times. So you can see we are getting more efficient and we are decarbonizing, but not at the fasted way too, way too little compared to uh, increases in the demand. So that's one of the huge challenges, but also Despite this progress, so many people have been left behind, and yet we are at one and a half degrees of the Paris Agreement. And as I mentioned, 8 million people die prematurely through indoor and regional air pollution. So that, I think, all clearly illustrates that the energy system has to fundamentally change. And I would argue that has a lot to do with the end use, with the demand, uh, as much as it does with the supply. Um, because so many people are without the access. And um, last but not least, let me say that I think the agenda, 2030 agenda of the UN with its 17 sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement, if we would make more progress in transforming in that direction, that would bring multiple benefits uh, for all of us, for the people, but also for the planet, for the earth systems. And you've heard about the food and, and the seas before. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have um, uh, created an initiative already bef before 2017, when the, 2030, uh, uh, when the 2030 agenda was approved, uh, to provide scientific underpinning in the de decade of uh, science for sustainability, I think it is important to say how important science is in making sure that we embark on this grand transformation. And we have concluded to reduce, the, to make it more operational and reduce the complexity. Our analysis shows that there are six transformations. If we would achieve those, then we would be on the best way of achieving 2030 agenda in general. And you know, I will not go into the details because of the shortness of time, but it has to do a lot with human capacity, consumption and production. We talked already about that. Think about the circular economy, decarbonizing energy, then the earth systems to provide food, fisheries, agriculture, sustainable land use, urbanization is another of the really powerful developments. And at the end, let me just mention digital revolution with AI and, and the other technologies. I'll say a few more words about that in the next six minutes. Next slide, please. 
And European community, just to re re remind there, for those of you who might be familiar with it, has tried to implement the make the 2030 agenda operational with a roadmap called European Green Deal. And you see where I put the error, there are eight priority areas and supply of the clean, affordable and secure energy is one of them. But on, on top of it, very important, mobilizing research and for, for uh, fostering innovation. So science, innovation are the key for achieving these goals. Next slide. So I wanted to schematically just illustrate, I think, what we are dealing with here. Um, on horizontal scale, you have human well-being. On the vertical scale, consumption, let's say, of energy services or 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 fish or fish or or, or healthy diets. And um, so, very often when we talk about the transformation in the future, and UN, for example, and the World Bank talk about satisfaction of the basic needs. That's clear, the minimum of everything that we need for survival, also energy. But that's not good enough for a sustainable future. And let me call that what we need is decent living, decent standards um, that would maximize human well-being. And at the same time, I think we need to overcome consumption and waste. And I think that's a little bit related to the presentation of the uh, Club of Rome back over 50 years ago. In order to have decent light for everybody, we also have to avoid overconsumption. And that means a fundamental change in our values, norms, uh, morality, I would argue also ethics to achieve this kind of safe and just future for all in the future. Uh, and so energy is an important component on that as well as food and clean water. Next slide. So what I wanted to show you is how huge the potential is, in particular on the end use. Uh, and let me just illustrate that to you briefly. Uh, look at the top right panel. This shows the energy transformation as we see it today in the world. Primary energy are energy sources like wind, uh, sun, uh, coal, oil, gas, and so on, nuclear. Um, on the right are the services, warm room, mobility, and other services that the energy system provides. And you can see that the ratio of services provided to the primary input is eight to one. That means that every unit of saving on the end use through sustainability and sufficiency measures will be multiplied eight times on the primary side. That means it would reduce the requirements by eight times. Okay, this is a theoretical maximum. You would say that we cannot realize all of that, but what if we can realize a factor of two or three? And so this is really important. That would provide more flexibility, security, and resilience for the future developments. And this is not an exception just for the energy system. If you look at the energy use in industry on the left, buildings in the middle, transportation below, we have a very similar situation. And then on the right, steel production, efficiency improvements potential is huge, irrigation as well. Um, and so let me just give you a historical example where that has been achieved in the energy area. Next slide, please. Uh, and these are the information and communication technologies. In the middle, you see many analog and digital devices that many of us have been using and probably don't have to use anymore because we have a smartphone on the left. And interestingly, if you look at the smartphone, it needs about five watts of energy. But if you look at the devices that it replaces and it provides more services, uh, it is a factor of 100 more efficient. I mean, this needs to be somehow really appreciated. Even in the standby, it's many more, more times sufficient. Next slide, please. And if you look at the amount of embedded energy and materials, it's also about 25 times efficient. And that was all achieved in, in three decades since the first digital phone, Motorola, that I'm projecting here on the top. So in 30 years, everybody in the world has a phone, and they're about 100 times more efficient than the uh, devices it re they replaces from the energy point of view, therefore also from the emissions point of view. So it's a huge achievement. Next slide. And this is why I would argue that the digital technologies offer a similar potential of improvement. But this is not a technical issue alone. It, of course, it has 
very strong economic dimensions of investments. Also, there was a very interesting earlier uh, present, uh, panel on the AI, on the potential benefits of AI in the communication, but also huge dangers that we know from ranging from deep fake to misinformation. So we need social steering for these technologies, but if, if they go in the right direction, the potential achievements are huge. So one of the changes and the icons represent what one could do is a shift from ownership to usership. Um, for example, uh, e-bikes, uh, renting e-bikes, using them, car share and so on. And in the rare are really true shared economy dimensions um, that, that would improve the efficiency further. And at the bottom, yellow, I think really important. These are the illustrations of the systemic changes that would be possible through digital technologies or convergence of digital technologies, including AI, so that the people, people and devices would be much more connected in a systemic way. If you think about a future that might be 100% renewable or renewable and nuclear to be net zero, um, in that kind of future, um, these systems have to be connected so that, for example, electric cars can store energy and give energy where needed when the, there is a, a lack of supply. Next slide. So I would like to conclude my presentation with, with this slide. It's a very recent study of my colleagues that have looked into the energy security and the effect of the demand side policies. So let me just say that um, the, 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 the usual, I, I would say the usual view that about energy security is that it, it's a supplied, supply uh, uh, question. And it is true, you, we have the fuel switch possibilities, but it's not just a supply. Uh, demand interventions are exceedingly important. An example I've mentioned is electrification of the transport, EVs and the rest of the system, improvement in the buildings, insulation, construction of passive houses shown there in red. So supply side options are important, but the demand is also crucial in the systemic way. And the, the pie chart shows that on the right are supply options. Clearly, that would improve security, such as on the on the uh, at the one a.m. Uh, pie. It says share of non-fossil fuels. If you can see that, increasing that would improve the security. Uh, reducing import dependency would as well. But on the left side are the demand demand side solutions that are together even more important. Um, if you look down at uh, at uh, five o'clock or seven, seven I'm sorry, seven o'clock pie, it says final energy efficiency. This is what I've shown where the potential is huge going from final energy to services or at the top at 11 o'clock saving in primary energy demand forces. So I hope I have illustrated to you that without a major transformation, we cannot achieve the energy goals and that the energy demand and energy services in the systemic context are the solution. And then last slide, I would like to thank you uh, for listening to me briefly and illustrate, can I have the last slide please? And illustrate two of the publications on which I've based my, my brief intervention in this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Naki or Nebusha very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we have uh, about uh, 20 minutes, between 15 and 20 minutes for the discussion. And I'm asking first the speakers to put questions to each other if they have them. Please uh, go on. Thomas, Ugo, Naki, please. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Lebosh. I, I was gonna, going to ask Ugo uh, what his view was of uh, the, the history of fisheries moving from traditional, usually largely coastal fisheries to uh, modern fishing factories with enormous amounts of bycatch. I know where do you think, um, do you think there is a place for small scale fisheries in a sustainable model? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, small scale fisheries do exist. Actually, they they operate. 
they produce food and they support population, coastal populations mainly. So right now what we are seeing is a, is a huge, um, I would not call it fight, but the interaction of this huge fisheries, huge industrial fisheries in um, and these small fisheries that continue to operate in the coastal regions. The United Nations are trying to control, to regulate, to manage this situation, but it is very, very difficult. And so your question is uh, is interesting, but I'm not sure I can answer it. There is still a space. For the time being, mm. they are surviving. But you have to be careful because even small fisheries can overexploit and destroy resources, especially yeah. if you go to... Um, uh, lakes and river resources they can be easily destroyed by even by small scale fisheries so we try mm. to move on as well as possible but as a, at one point that i think is very interesting on this subject is the work by eleanor ostrom that you may know you do she is the economist who um who work at the small scale management of a shared management of resources which is an extremely interesting possibility. I uh, let me no just just a note. Sorry, I don't want to take too much space here. But just was the note. Mm. I I've been working with people in the mountains of Italy uh, who have been managing the forest for first Middle Ages, the hundreds of years, and still the resource is still there. The forest is still there because it has been micromanaged. Ostrom style, which is typical. The problem with fisheries is that it is extremely difficult to do that. So they are, even uh, Ostrom herself, I don't think she studied fisheries because it, it is honestly a bit savage, if you, if you allow me. And so one of the many problems we have, sorry, too, too many things I, 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 I said. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, Mark, Mark, uh, if, excuse if, me. Uh, please yeah. go on, Thomas, please. If, if I may, the other question I had, I'm sorry to be hogging the space here, but to Ugo was about coral reefs. We've been told that in the next 10 years or so, they will all be gone or largely gone. Um, or certainly in the next 20 years, what will be the impact of that? on ah, world fisheries, another, given that another, a third of all marine creatures live in coral reefs. So what's going to happen? That's another very good question for which I don't have an answer. <laughs> I, okay. I can make models. I can make models and uh, the models catch something of the complexity of the real world. But uh, but uh, mm, but really about coral reefs, it's... Uh, it's uh, observation that uh, is not for people like me who are modelists but people who are biologists and naturalists they say they are very worried mm -hmm. you know that as well as uh, as yeah. i do so yeah. it's another another critical point in our relation with nature which we don't seem to be able to manage mm -hmm. uh, that's what i, I can okay. say okay yeah now thanks for the questions and i, I have a question for you then, uh, Borja, can I can I ask this question? Please, please, please go on. Okay, go Thomas, on. Do you do you think the people who work in uh, the field that you in which you have shown um, so many interesting data, food production by agriculture, do you, do you think they understand the fact that food production is increasing? Yes, but. This increase is extremely fragile in the sense that it depends on the availability of synthetic fuels and fertilizers and, um, and pesticides. And mm. it is going down, actually, in terms of food per person. But if you if you look at the, what is being said normally, they always say, well, we had the Green Revolution, as you showed, and it has been going up and will keep going up. And indeed, it's still, it is still going up a little, but but uh, per capita, no. Do you think people understand the, the implications of this situation? No, I think a lot of people don't understand the implications. Um, 
of of that um, sort of fragility that is built into the, the aggressive industrial agriculture system that we have. And I mean, I, I talk to farmers also in Europe, in France and elsewhere, and the state of the soils is really quite bad. And uh, we've been losing topsoil at a rapid rate because of overly deep plowing, use of, use of you know, monoculture and so on and so forth, loss of hedges. And, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated, but um, clearly it's, it's very fragile. The the gains that we've made are, are fragile, and we, we're seeing now that um, productivity per hectare is actually going down. And I, I want to also remind of that quality gap because the problem with these statistics often that they are only measuring calories. We want to produce a lot of calories. We want sugar and fat, and healthy food is something completely different. You may have an increase in calories without uh, improved nutrition. So it's, uh, it's from the public health perspective, um, we are doing even worse than, than if you just look at the calories. Yeah. I, I, I also okay. have a question. Abosha, is it okay? For, please, please go on. Please for go Thomas on. and Uwe. The same question. I mean, I think both of you have shown that we are really threatening the global commons, you know, land, uh, agricultural land, uh, the oceans with, with our over exploitation um, of ecosystems and the oceans. And, you know, but my, my point is that I think we have both also pointed out that the food is no longer healthy. I mean, it's not just it is it is fat as well, but uh, and salt, high content of salt, but in particular, very high content of processed food. So we are ruining the system mm -hmm. to produce relatively unhealthy food. So my question is, is perhaps too difficult, but how can we make sure to reorient people, not just for sustainable energy, but also for sustainable and healthy food that in the supermarkets, you know, up front, we have healthy food that is not more expensive than the processed and unhealthy food that brings many uh, health and other disadvantages. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, in dealing with the food industry, it's almost as bad as the uh, tobacco industry. You know, the likes of Pepsi, who uh, produce un unthinkable amounts of ultra-sweet drinks you know, that cause obesity in children and in, and in adults. Um, the additives they put in... Um, is really well, these are drug dealers methods you know coffee and you know energy drinks and, and really the only argument they put forward to justify you know making money out of you know mass fertilities you know massive numbers of people having premature deaths the only justification is, oh, well, you know, the individual consumer has the right to choose what they put in their shopping cart. But it's actually, in many places, very difficult to find healthy food. In many American cities, for example, you have these so-called food deserts. You just can't find any healthy food. They don't stock it. Um, and the problem is really regulation. It's just like the tobacco industry. Um the, when the motive is profit and only profit, what do you expect? You either have strict regulation or they're going to do whatever they can to maximize profit. That's just the nature. In fact, they have the duty to do so vis-a-vis -vis their shareholders, you could say. You know, there, there needs to be legis legislative change. Uh, on, the, on the other hand... Um, I think um, it's also, um, it starts in agriculture and, and what is produced. If you have huge amounts of uh, land dedicated, for example, to producing maize, yeah, you have then these massive amounts of, of fructose 
of of uh, corn uh, syrup, corn starch, uh, and that sort of those are the products. Uh, why do we subsidize the production of these products that all find their way into these processed foods? And uh, you know, fructose, you know, in small amounts is great, but in large amounts, it accumulates in the liver. It's one of the leading causes of metabolic disease. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So that has to be, you know, policy has to change. Uh, I don't know why we allow people to sell products that are not safe. For example, why do we why do we allow that? No. You can't sell a machine that's not safe, but you can sell food that's not safe. <laughs> yeah. And if if you allow oh, me a comment on what Professor Rother said, is that we, in addition to the poor quality of the food. We have another big, enormous problem emerging right now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the <laughs> gentleman <laughs> only talking about problems, but but there is the problem of packaging. I don't know if you if you stop thinking about that is a subject that I am trying to work on right now. But you know, most of food pack packaging is made of plastics. Which is not a bad idea, idea in itself, because plastics allows to keep the food um, stable to to make it last longer. In principle, problem is that we are discovering right now the plastics is not so inert and safe as it was supposed to be. Maybe you know that according to the uh, some studies, plastics contains some. How can you guess how many components? It's 130,000 components in plastic, estimated, probably more. So can you understand the difficulty of mm -hmm. understanding what a single component may do or not do? And uh, and then uh, we uh, made this great idea. We make so much plastics. We keep growing. And then when we throw away the plastic, it is um, goes through the ecosystem. It's eaten by the fish. And then we eat the fish and we eat the plastic. Not so smart, honestly. <laughs> and, and so when, uh, let's hope for the best. Uh, there is a question from the that we received that, that, that was, what is the place for degrowth? Oh, please, the answer that. Uh, yeah, I just I, wanted to say that. It's yeah, yeah, coming from the, from from the you, audience, yeah, please. You, you can please answer it, Neboja, but uh, no, 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 my... Go my, on, my no. My modest opinion is that we are growing. The problem we have, as Donella Meadows, one of the historical founders of the Club of Rome, said the problem is only one, it is growth. But be careful because it is not obvious that if growth a problem, it's not obvious that degrowth is a solution. Uh, too much degrowth may be bad for you, at least in my opinion. Okay, uh, we are very close yeah. to the end of the session. Let me put a question to uh, to uh, Thomas, but it can also be a question to the others. Uh, Thomas has mentioned that the food crisis in many developing countries is in fact a result of the strong role of corporations and the weak role of the governments of these countries. This means for me that the problem can be solved only with an adequate ideological change or ideological shift in which small yeah. farmers organizations yeah. should become equal partners with all other stakeholders. Thomas, am I right? That's right. And it's exactly what is happening. So, you know, we, said we have a lot of problems and no solutions, but there are, there, this is actually happening. And uh, farmers uh, in Indonesia, I mentioned they have a 2 million strong organization. And they are now, uh, directly approaching political candidates during elections, pushing them to make commitments to support them and their efforts. And that's good. Yeah, so they're kind of voting in blocks to support a particular agenda. They're putting, they're exerting political pressure. That is happening. Uh, what is not yet happening is they're not quite yet aligned with consumers. And that's also in Europe. You have strong farmers movement uh, uh, everywhere you know in, from poland to france you've seen the the, the protests but they don't the, the link with consumers is weak so the, i think 
consumers and farmers need to discover their shared uh, interests and uh, develop a joint political uh, list of demands because really they are in the same boat. You know, we have, for example, in Australia just had a big scandal because uh, we, you know, we had inflation there like everywhere else, and then it turned out that the uh, two uh, uh, big supermarket chains had been profit gouging. In other words, they had they had some cost increases, but only accounting for about a third of the price increases for consumers. So the rest of the money they pocketed and had astronomical profits. Uh, in the, the wake of COVID, so you can see, you can see that you know consumers and farmers were both squeezed by these supermarkets. They pay uh, prices to the farmers that they cannot live on that kind of money, and the consumers cannot afford to buy food, let alone healthy food. So you can see how the the corporations kind of squeeze both the consumers and the farmers, and they need to talk more. I think. Okay, since we are at the real end, just a quick question to uh, Naki. Uh, after the uh, first ever global nuclear energy summit, which was held in March uh, this year in Brussels, what can you say very briefly about nuclear energy? What is this prospect, especially for developing countries? Do you see that? No. Yes, I do. I mean, as you know, I'm old enough to remember days when we were talked about 50 years ago that nuclear will make energy too cheap to uh, to uh, to meter and so you know the experience has been different but i think i think there are potentials in the future um and that is i, I would argue smaller more resilient more safe reactors also because of the emphasis on the energy security that puts pressure on producing energy domestically i think the major challenge that needs to be overcome and you asked me to be brief, so just last statement. The last, the major challenge that needs to be overcome is the construction time, because that makes nuclear energy very expensive. So the construction time, overnight costs need to be reduced through smaller modular reactors that can be produced in large scale. I think that would empower nuclear to be a part of the zero, zero carbon solution in the long run. Thank you very much. And now, since uh, we are at the end of the session, let me thank all the speakers. Uh, thank, I'm thanking you very much for a lot of information about the fields. We have covered <laughs> three very broad fields, and we shall definitely continue to do so within the Academy in the forthcoming events. Thank you.